Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity now to share the word, and we pray for hungry hearts. We pray for changed hearts. We pray, Lord, this word will go into the places where you want it to go, and it'll have the that it'll accomplish what you want to accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. No joke this morning. Not because, but it's a tar. It's this is a tough time, you know. All day long yesterday, they were ringing bells and reading names, and reliving the horror of 20 years ago. And that now has to compete with the horror of right now, you know, of right now. Of, this, of this, well, I'm not saying anything anymore, maybe about that. But in the beginning verses of Exodus um, chapter 1 with verse 5 especially we're informed uh, that the Israelites that is the descendants of Jacob Israel was Jacob's other name if you didn't know that and they numbered 70 people in all when they went to Joseph in Egypt remember that this family had started with five people five people only Jacob, he had four wives, and that was the children of the four wives became the 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 children from those four wives. So in Exodus chapter 1, starting with verse 5, the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers... And all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. The first seven verses of Exodus condenses 400 years of history. There's 400 years in those seven verses. And the Israelites had become five things, which are actually all one thing, but different ways to say it. They had multiplied greatly. They had increased in numbers, which is saying the same thing. They had become numerous, which is saying the same thing. The land was filled with them. Exceedingly fruitful, multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, became numerous, and the land was filled with them. So five terms to describe how numerous and blessed the Israelites had become in Egypt. God made a way for them to go down there to escape um, a regional famine, which was going on in Egypt as well. But because Joseph went there, God gave Joseph the formula for survival of that nation and other nations around them too went in there to buy grain because Joseph had set up these granaries and uh, for the good years so that they would have grain in the bad years. And it sums up the developments of 400 years. And I think exactly when the Israelites left was 430 years to the day from when they had gone down there. But it was a fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the effect that their posterity would become a mighty nation, innumerable as the stars of heaven and numberless as the sands of the seashore. That doesn't mean there's, that there's as many of them as the sand. That just means they're innumerable. That means they can't be numbered when you see them. There are so many. Well, that, that, that power of them um, frightened the Pharaoh. But it was the power of Almighty God himself that aided Israel providentially in becoming a mighty nation inside of another nation. Nothing could have been greater or more powerful um, or powerful enough to have hindered the purpose of the great God, Jehovah. Nothing could be powerful enough to hinder the power of God. This was the same power that intervened at the Red Sea, the same power that intervened at Jericho, and down long centuries afterwards, the same power on the cross of Calvary. In fact, it's the same power that intervened in each one of us to turn from our sinful ways, like Charlie Daniels was singing about. Come
come out of the darkness of our own way, because our own way doesn't lead us to heaven, into the holy light of God's way, the gospel. Thank you. <laughs> Verse 8, then a new king who Joseph, whom Joseph, uh, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt, a new king. This was not only just a new king, this was a whole new dynasty. As a matter of fact, there had been other dynasties in between in the intervening 400 years. It wasn't just like the next king, you know, like in a movie. It was a new king, and it was a totally different dynasty, and he didn't know anything about Joseph, who was held in high regard in the old, in, in his time, because he rescued the nation from starvation. Verse 9, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. He was terrified that these people, who weren't the same as him, could become so numerous that he would be overwhelmed with them. Egypt had been conquered by the Hyksos, if you know anything about the history. They were a Canaanite people, probably from northern Syria, and they had set up a dynasty in Egypt, and eventually they were driven out by the Egyptians, and that is probably why this pharaoh, who was most scholars think was Thutmose I, was terrified of the Hebrews because of what had happened in, in history uh, with the Hyksos. He probably feared that they becoming so numerous would overthrow the dynasty and rule Egypt in their own dynasty because that's what had happened with the Hyksos. So Exodus uh, chapter 1 going down to verse 15, it starts with the words, the king of Egypt. Now this pharaoh... Um, in Exodus 1.22, uh, who's responsible for the genocide of the Hebrews, the baby boys, is most likely thought most the first, which matches what we know of his character from Egyptian records. Pharaoh's daughter was most likely Hatshepsut, who would later become a pharaoh herself. I only know of two female pharaohs. Cleopatra was the other one. There may have been others, I don't know, but she would become a pharaoh herself. Her power and influence would explain why Moses had a reasonable amount of security among those of the ruling Egyptian dynasty, which was her father's dynasty, despite being a Hebrew. Moses was a Hebrew. Continuing in verse 15, verse 15 started, was that me? Did I do that? Did I drop some? Nothing fell down. Uh, verse 15 started with the king of Egypt. So thought most the first. It continues in verse 15. He said to the Hebrew midwives, whose name was Shifra and Pua. Now there are theories as to who these two midwives were. Some Jewish traditions hold that they were actually Jochebed and, and Miriam, which was Moses' mother and sister. I have a hard time swallowing that theory. But some experts claim that they were Egyptian, and some think that they were Hebrews. And some think the translation is where it says the Hebrew, the Egyptian midwives, uh, maybe it should have said the midwives to the Hebrews, which would have made them Hebrews. But there are probably half a million Hebrew women at this time. Two midwives. Well, it just isn't enough to go around. Two midwives just can't get that done. So they probably either were head midwives and had a team that could go out. We don't know. We don't know. Verse 16, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby as a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. Now, 
Thutmose the first had a reputation for being ruthless. But the midwives, however, it says they feared God in verse 17 and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. So they let the boys live. So if these midwives were Egyptians, they were righteous Egyptians because it says they feared God. Jehovah, Yahweh, they feared God so they wouldn't kill those little baby boys. And if they were Hebrews, they were God-fearing and would not murder. So either way, whether they're Egyptians or whether they're Hebrews, they were still God-fearing midwives and refused to, to kill these uh, baby boys. My question would, know, would be, how did he know? How did he know? And he says, why have you let the boys live? Verse 19, the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So the midwives made up a story uh, to avoid being the object of Pharaoh's wrath because he would imprison them. He could even execute them for not obeying what he said. So that story may have been true. It could be that the Hebrew women were more vigorous um, and the babies were already born and hidden away by the time they got there. That's possible. But God blessed the Hebrew women. He wanted a nation to emerge from Egypt. He wanted the nation of Israel to come forth out of there. The Messiah would come from that nation. God has a plan that's eternal. Verse 20, so God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, verse 21, he gave them families of their own, a reward for their righteousness and fearing God. When we refuse to compromise our faith, God will bless us. When we refuse to compromise. Verse 22, then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. In those days, he, the boys could grow up to be a fighting force. So he didn't want the boys to live. It was okay to let the girls live. And he gave this order to all of his people. If you see a Hebrew baby, throw him in the Nile. He was a desperate man. Desperate. Now, we don't know if any Hebrew baby boys were thrown into the Nile. It doesn't tell us. But he felt threatened by the increase of the Hebrews. God had blessed them dramatically. And his desperation, his terror was equally dramatic. Ordering infants to be killed. But the, the midwives would not obey him. They feared God. They would not compromise. Obeying God instead of the rules of the state or of society or of men is what we're talking about today. Another example is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They wouldn't bow down to the golden image that was set up by Nebuchadnezzar. So they were thrown into a fiery furnace and they said to the king, and the King James, we are not even careful to answer thee, O King. I love that. In the King James, we're not even careful to answer you. They would not compromise, even though they were going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And you know, they said they, they came out of the furnace, weren't even singed. Another example was Daniel. He was a friend of theirs. He was thrown into the lion's den because he wouldn't stop praying to his God out of the window. He would not compromise. Another example in Acts 5, 27 to 29, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. 
We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. They would not compromise their faith. They would not. They refuse. We belong to the king. We're the slaves of our God. We choose to be that. Romans 6.22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. There's no compromise between the will of God and the life of the believer. No compromise. And the constantly changing attitudes of society tempt us on every way and every side to compromise. Missionaries around the world, some in hostile countries, will not compromise. They carry the gospel in the face of death. We had a young fellow that came to speak. And he was a young guy, and he was getting ready to go to an Arab country. Might have been Sudan. They will kill you. And his friend said to him, but you'll die. And he said, I'm already dead. <laughs> I'm dead to sin, but alive to God through Christ Jesus. He wouldn't compromise. We belong to the king. There can be no compromise in our attitude toward socialism. There's nothing good about socialism. Nothing. It's ungodly. It's blatantly against God. This is from a Jewish website. In 1000 AD, the world's population was 200 million. Life was short and dangerous for almost everyone. Disease and poverty were rampant. Even kings lived f far worse than a lower income individual in a large western city today. Yet, in less than a millennium, global population has grown to over 5 billion people, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom live in a state of health and comfort their ancestors could only dream of. According to David Landis, an economic historian, who is not in any way a religious man or a Bible believer, this astounding progress is due to Judeo-Christian biblical thinking, which is directly opposed to socialism and Marxism. Marxism even is even worse. They think it's okay to kill people who don't agree with their sick worldview. Thus far, Marxism has never worked in real life. It just enslaves the people. And without exception, in the places where Marxism has been the governmental model, Christians have been persecuted. They can't have that philosophy floating around because it's opposed to their socialist principles. That's because there's a foundational difference between Marxism and Christianity. A deep divide that cannot be bridged. There are several aspects of Marxism as a philosophy that puts it at odds with the Christian faith. For example, Marxism is at heart an atheistic, atheistic philosophy with no room for belief in God. Karl Marx himself was clear on this point. He said the first requisite of the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. They imprisoned people who had faith. They took their Bibles and burned them. A criticism of the Hegelian philosophy of right in 1844. Christianity, of course, is rooted in theism. That is, we believe in God, and it's all about God. In the Marxist model, the state becomes the provider, not God. The state, the sustainer, not God. The protector, 
not God, and a lawgiver for every, every citizen. In short, the state is viewed as God. Christians always appeal to a higher authority, the God of the universe, and Marxist governments don't like the idea of there being any authority higher than themselves. One of the basic tenets of Marxism is that the idea of private property must be abolished. Where Marxism has taken root, landowners see their property confiscated by the state and private ownership of just about anything is outlawed in abolishing private property. Marxism directly contradicts several biblical principles. The Bible assumes the existence of private property and issues commands to respect it. Injunctions such as, you shall not steal, that respects people's ownership of things. But those things are meaningless without private property. Marxism in practice doesn't work out so well. Communist regimes produce the greatest ideological carnage in human history, killing more than a hundred million people. BLM is by their own website Marxist. That means they want religion abolished. They want the family abolished. They want private property abolished. Marxism is being taught as a virtue in our universities today. They think Marxism is great. It's being taught or snuck into our schools, high schools, and increasingly in grade schools, they sneak it in there. So now you have to investigate what your children are exposed to in school. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Counter teach. Find out what their kids, your kids and grandkids are learning. And if it's not gospel, if it's Marxism or socialism, counter teach it. There are helps online to counter teach it. Another thing that's crept into our society is homosexuality. God calls such behavior abomination in the Bible. Don't compromise. There can be nothing godly about such activity. That's what was going on in Sodom. Don't compromise. This nation has murdered 62 million unborn babies. There's a counter online, you can see it, it keeps ticking every time there's another one. The abortion counter. 62 million. One of them probably had the cure for cancer. Murder is murder. Texas passed a law outlawing abortions past six weeks. <laughs> passed when there's a heartbeat. People are out there demonstrating, practically foaming at the mouth about this. Oh, women will have to cross state lines to get abortions. Women will have to go into back alleys and practice with doing coat hangers. And Well, how about just delivering a live baby? How about that? If you can't have another child, or, or then just give it for adoption and loving people will take care of it. Tell me how it is that abortion has something to do with women's health. What about the health of that little baby? Tell me how it is. Tell me how having a child can threaten your life. Tell me. People are using abortion as birth control. People are using abortion, abortion as a way to choose the sex of a child. Judgment is coming. Don't compromise. Never vote for any candidate who supports evil. This is a critical time in this country. And around the world, there's no time to be compromising. There's no time. 
Proverbs 4, 23 to 27. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Verse 24, keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your, from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze, your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Do not compromise. Be careful that you don't get sucked into compromising situations. Be careful of what you fill your mind with. Be careful of the temptation to take a sip of this or a peek at that. On the internet, mainly, or wherever. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Be alert and of sober mind your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. The midwives in Exodus did not compromise because it says they feared God. We need to be the people of God, not hiding and not compromising. We need to be right out there speaking the truth. Too many Christians are hiding. A hiding Christian is an ineffective Christian. Don't be afraid and don't compromise. Isaiah 41, 10 to 13. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Those you search, though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. My friends, brothers and sisters, we have to take a stand these days. There's a war going on war against your soul. People in high places are working together with the enemy. They want to be in charge of everything. People in, in, in colleges and schools, oh, socialism is benign, it just takes care of everybody. It's evil. Marxism is evil. And we have to be vocal about our opposition to it. Don't compromise. Be prepared. Read the Bible. It'll give you answers. Don't hide. The people in your office are touting the benefits of socialism or abortion or whatever. Don't be afraid to speak up. God hates that stuff. He hates it. And we're out there to speak out. Too many Christians are hiding, compromising, feasting on stuff that they see on internet or television or whatever. That stuff gets into your spirit. You have to guard your heart. Amen? You have to guard. You have to be on guard. That what comes into your heart is godly and holy. Don't compromise, all right? Okay? Amen? No compromise. <laughs> Have godly principles. Would you stand? It's eight, it's eleven fifty-eight. The Baptists are probably already at the at the restaurant, so <laughs>
Dear Lord, we thank you today for the truth of your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that we are the people. That we are God's people. In this time, which is a dangerous time, but we thank you that we are here. We are the ones who send us. Send us. Help us, Lord, as we go into the world. Help us, Lord. Arm us with words and the Holy Spirit. So let us be the people who will 